Hey guys, this is Frank Decker, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overeem. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. DJ Dillashaw. You're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio UFC 238 preview show. It is episode 187, the 5th of June, a Wednesday and a very rainy and cold morning. We are coming at you straight out of Melbourne, Dennis Stratton and Kasper Olszewski. We are back, baby, after a bit of a break. Uh, man, it feels good to be back with another episode of Submission Radio Cast. It does feel good. I mean, the, the, the weather is crappy and cold, but the, the episode is hot and sexy. So, <laughs> you know, you know, steaming in your earbuds right now or your headphones, whatever you're wearing, wherever you are listening to the program. But you're right. It's been a couple of weeks, Submission Radio. We had some sexy freaking lineups and then some mm-hmm. disaster struck, some unfortunate things uh, in, in your personal life, Dennis, if you want to tell the people why. Why we've been away for, for a couple of weeks and, and explain to them why they've been missing us so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully they've been missing us. A lot of lovely messages for all, from our, all our listeners, friends and MMA members. What a, what a sort of brutal start to the year or even sort of six months it's been for me. Um, setting this, the record kind of straight, it came to Australia sort of with, in a, with a four-member family and two of those mo- members passed away in a very, very short and uh, a close time. My grandfather at the end of last year and then my grandmother just a, a couple of weeks back um, unfortunately from brain cancer so it was it was a very very difficult time still dealing with it now but um you know I, you know Cass, i think it's important to mention it because uh, i know a lot of people are going through tough times a lot of our listeners are going through tough times you know a lot of their families are dealing with serious illnesses and and you know they might be in a hospital right now listening to this to sort of take their mind off things and you know, I, I guess the message there is, you know, you guys aren't alone. You know, speak to your family, speak to your friends. I was very lucky. You know, you messaged me a number of times. I had a lot of lovely family and friends around me sort of sending me positive vibes and, and, and being there for me. So so don't be afraid to turn to your friends and family. And, you know, don't be afraid to talk about your feelings. And, you know, just understand that we, we get shit. We're there for you. You know, it, it's not easy to talk about these sorts of things. And, and there is a bright light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that better place right now, Cass. I'm not gonna lie, still a little bit tough. Still sort of dealing it one day at a time. But but everybody out there, I think it's important to understand. Yeah, you know, even us. You know, we're, we're human. Our lives aren't perfect. Even the submission radio guys who cut jokes at every press conference and media week, <laughs> you know, have their moments where they don't feel so good. And, and if you ever do feel really, really down, you know, there's a lot of great lifelines. You know, I know depression is huge, especially in males. In Australia, America, all over the place. So just make sure to talk to a friend, talk to somebody, damn it, just slide into our DMs even, and uh, we're, we're always there for our listeners. So it's great to be back there, Cass. And I mean, you see 238. I feel like this is a preview show that there's a lot of stuff to get through. And we've got a couple of guys, Cass, on this program, and one OG that has never been on the program before, and a, 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 a Submission Radio family favorite, Tommy Toehold, on the program i mean this is one episode i'm excited about yeah there's a lot to get excited about and just just quickly despite your beautiful segue in, into the guests and the lineup i have to say man it's pretty inspiring for me to see you bounce back so quickly and so soon after going through so much uh you know it it one of the silver linings is it helps put things in perspective sometimes when i'm having a crappy day and i'm annoyed about certain things i look at some of the stuff that you've been through and i see you soldiering on you know, kind of marching mm-hmm. forward and being strong. And it makes me think, well, you know, what? I need to I need to start bitching and moaning about these tiny little insignificant by comparison things in my life. And I need to, you know, maybe be as strong as a guy like yourself who's, you know, <laughs> going out there soldiering on. So, you know, th- thanks for being you. And, uh, you know, as as someone who's known you for way more than half my life, it's, it's good to see you kind of like, you know, back on the good track and even sitting here, doing the show with you this week man i'm i'm, I'm super grateful and uh, you know it's it's good to see you sort of back on the man so a massive a massive ups to yourself but you're right thank you man that's awesome thank you 100 percent uh us us and oscar willis from the mac life you, you know we always love you man um but it, it is it is a sexy episode and a sexy show you mentioned a an og dan stup the co-founder of mma junkie yes that mma junkie is going to be gracing us with his presence he is the 
managing editor of The Athletic, theathletic.com, obviously putting together a super team with some of MMA's biggest and best writers. And we want to get Dan on to discuss that whole process, how it all came together, the vision, what kind of content they're going to be putting out. And uh, I guess just the, the MMA media landscape in general in 2019, it's so different to 2006 when he co-founded MMA Junkie. And of course, we'll talk to Dan about UFC 238 since it is a UFC 238 preview show. Also, the man who floats into our dreams at the most unexpected times, <laughs> Brett Akamoto will be jumping back on the program. Who could forget him at UFC 234 sitting there, blue polo, backwards hat, cool as ever while we're, you know, slaves to the UFC's uh, <laughs> uniform policy or, you know, dress dress smart casual, they say. Well, why, why can't we just dress cool like Brett Okamoto? But he's coming on to talk about UFC 238. Say you what, man, there's a lot of things to get excited about for UFC 238. The return of Tony Ferguson versus Donald Cerrone. What kind of Tony Ferguson are we going to be getting? How does he match up against Donald Cerrone? This new dad version of Donald Cerrone. You got Valentina Shevchenko defending a belt against Jessica I. You got Henry Cejudo versus Marlon Moraes. What a fascinating fight. Henry Cejudo coming up. Maybe will be the UFC's fourth champ champ by the end of this weekend. You got Australia's own tied to Avasa. Versus Blagoy Ivanov, any opportunities for Shuis? I'm in, I'm there. Tatiana Suarez, need an answer of. You got Aljamain Sterling versus Pedro Munoz. Karolina Kovalkovic against Alexa Grasso. Ricardo Lamas takes on Calvin Cater in a very fan-friendly fight. Jimmy Rivera comes back against Pedian. A lot of a lot of fun fights. It's a very stacked card and uh, a lot to talk about for this episode, Dennis. That's right, Cass. And before we jump into it, just a quick reminder of everybody out there, jump on social media. If you haven't followed us on Instagram, there's a lot of fun updates there. Insta stories, of course, Facebook and Twitter. Our DMs are open to everybody. So, you know, feel free to message us through there or even Facebook messages or even Instagram messages. We respond to them all personally and we love hearing from all of our listeners, Cass. Don't forget, guys, we've, of course, got Tommy Toehold on the program as well. Dennis, I know you mentioned it a little bit before, but... I just have to say, man, massive, massive uh, props to Tommy Toehold for mm. always sending in his hilarious stuff. And I, I always look forward to downloading it, and it just it it just cracks me the fuck up. I don't know how... I, I'm always in awe. You know when you see a comedian, and he just makes it so effortless, and you just think, mm. how, where does this come from? Where, where, where do you find the motivation for this? Where do you come up with this material? But yeah, Tommy Toehold... I guess a fixture of these Submission Radio UFC preview shows. You can't have one without Tommy Toehold. I'm glad we have him on the program this week, Dennis. Absolutely. Tommy Toehold, an absolute legend. Can't wait to hear what he says. And I, I feel like this is, we're kind of, uh, before before the UFC catches onto this, because I feel like they will catch onto this eventually. Tommy Toehold will soon be a part of every countdown, official UFC yeah. countdown. And, and I kind of feel like we'll, we'll be a part of the story there. So I'm excited that he's <laughs> gracious enough to uh to be a part of our preview shows before he moves on to the big leagues and is actually on, on uh, ESPN doing his thing. Yeah, everyone's going to ESPN, so it's it is imminent that Tommy Toehold will uh, jump on board to ESPN at some point. But anyway, it's a fun show, it's a sexy show. Our guests are waiting on the line, and Dennis, I believe we've got the first one, and you're about to introduce him. All right, guys, this is a very special treat. Our next guest is making his first appearance on the program. The managing editor for one of the most exciting new web websites in the MMA space, the Athletic MMA. It's a pleasure to welcome MMA journalism royalty, the OG himself, Dan Stubb, for the first time to Submission Radio. Dan, so happy to have you on the program. It's awesome to be here. Thanks for the uh, the amazing uh, introduction. I, I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> the, the, the pleasure is absolutely all ours. Um, before we get into UFC 238, we obviously have to congratulate you on your new position as the managing editor for the hottest and most exciting new websites in the MMA space, The Athletic. Um, you have quite a list of all-stars coming to The Athletic. Take us into the process of putting this t team together. you got Chuck Mendenhall, Sean Alshadi, Fernando Prades, Chad Dundas, Josh Gross, and Ben Folks. How do you go about putting such an all-star team together? I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I mean, it's it, obviously it's an, it's an embarrassment of riches to have that many fantastic writers on one mm. staff. Uh, I think the athletic, uh, they moved pretty quickly kind of putting the team together. Um, they, uh, they had some names in mind before they even spoke to me, uh, just for the writing team. So, uh, when they started talking to me, it was kind of, well, what do you think about this guy and this guy and this guy? And it was like, well, yeah, of course I want those guys. And, uh, so it just, 
it kind of fell into place. But I, I think kind of universally, the, the the people with the athletic, the guys that they were targeting were the same guys that I kind of had in mind. So when they asked me to give them uh, kind of my dream team and it matched up with their dream team. I think, you know, we, we've got a good idea of kind of uh, who the really good writers are in this space. And, and thankfully, you know, they, they had the budget and uh, the wherewithal to, to go after the best names that they could. So uh, like I said, it makes my job super easy and it's awesome to be working with guys like that. Mm. I'm, I'm curious. So you mentioned, so they suggested a lot of these guys, which is uh, kind of a surprise because I thought you would have been the guy that sort of put these names, out there. That means the guys at the athletic, they must be, you know, pretty big MMA fans. They must really do their homework and know what they're doing um, and really be fans of the sport to sort of know all these guys and put together such a list. Yeah, the the executives there, you know, kind of the one, one if people aren't real familiar with the athletic, it's a, a subscription website. Uh, most of the time they have a discounts going on, you know, where it comes out to two or three bucks a month. Um, you know, it's not a, a huge amount, but the benefit of that is we don't have to worry about advertisers or sponsorships or paid content. Um, so the kind of people who gravitate toward that website and including the bosses, kind of the guys who put the MMA team together, uh, you know, th their focus is absolutely just on journalism. It's not, you know, uh, who has the biggest following or, or can write the clickiest content or who produces the most content. Uh, the focus really is on just good storytelling and good journalism. Um, you know, so, you know, the guys we've been dealing with, you know, they're vets from, you know, ESPN, uh, Sports Illustrated, uh, some of the bigger newspapers in the country. So, yeah, I mean, even if they didn't know MMA, those are the type of guys who, who know who to talk to uh, to find out who the, the best kind of writers in the space are. And, and honestly, I think that the main reason I kind of, you know, got on the radar was it, it sounds like one of the first guys I talked to was Ariel Hawani. Uh, obviously, he's pretty happy at ESPN and, and wasn't looking to jump ship. But, uh, you know, he, he kind of gave them some names uh, of guys that, you know, would probably be probably be good for the for the athletic. I, you know, thankfully, he was one of the names I've mentioned. Uh, I'm forever indebted to, to Ariel because of that. But, you know, I think once you talk to a guy like Ariel, who probably, you know, mentions names like, you know, Ben Folks and and Sean Ashanti, and you start talking to them, then, you know, they mentioned some of the same guys. So it just kind of snowballed. But like I said, thankfully, kind of the same names I had in mind were the same names that they had in mind. Uh, so it really worked out well for us. It's crazy that they went after Ariel as well. I mean, he, he's a very good fit with ESPN, and you can totally understand why he'd want to stay there. But, you know, to, to think that, you know, there was even a chance that we might have Ariel mm -hmm. Hawani, you know, with, with the athletic, that, uh, that obviously shows how serious they are about this. Just on Ariel, there has been some major shifts, you know, in the industries from a media perspective, uh, you know, with obviously Ariel going to ESPN and a lot of new faces in MMA fighting now. That team's kind of completely changed. Uh, where do you sort of see the industry now uh, from a media perspective compared to 2006 when you co-founded MMA Junkie? Yeah, I mean, it's night and day. I mean, it feels night and day just, you know, from two or three years ago, let yeah. alone 12 years ago. Um, you know, I think getting players like ESPN and, and the athletic, um, you know, is good for the industry. Not only does it create new job opportunities there, but, you know, the guys who leave from MMA junkie and MMA fighting, um, you know, it opens up spots for, you know, new guys at those sites and, and maybe the, the young guys who have been working real hard who haven't really gotten their opportunity. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of in favor. Like, I, I know everybody wants to build their staffs and I'm sure you know, fighting and junkie were, were kind of disappointed to lose some of their names. Um, but I, I think we see really cool stuff when people start, you know, moving sites and taking new jobs, uh, just kind of like everyone at the athletic, I think they're so motivated, you know, we've got this new opportunity and this new website. Um, I, I think those guys are, are just so excited. It, it really kind of taps into your creative juices and, and provides a lot of motivation. Uh, and I think the guys at the other sites who have, you know, kind of moved from one site to another or they're still with the, the site that they've been with for a while, but now they've got new co-workers. I, I think it just kind of, you know, kind of sticks a, a jolt of electricity uh, through the whole kind of MMA media and, and gets people excited and trying new stuff. So uh, I, I think it's good, you know, to, to kind of shake things up from time to time. It, it keeps everybody on their toes and I think it ends up leading to really good content. Mm. I mean, we mentioned MMA Junkie before. It's an absolute juggernaut when it comes to coverage. And you're the co-founder of that website. And Casper mentioned 2006. 
is when it happened. Is it weird sort of being, uh, for example, with The Athletic and not being a part of MMA Junkie, being a co-founder and sort of seeing it do its own thing on the side without you having to do anything from it? I, I'd imagine it's like having a child grow up and move and go to college and then you're <laughs> sort of onto the next thing. So to talk us through that, because I imagine it would be an interesting sort of experience. No, I've got a lot of really fun memories. Uh, MMA junkie, you know, just kind of starting something from scratch. It's always going to hold a kind of special place in your heart. But, uh, you know, we sold MMA junkie to USA Today in, in 2011. And, and I kind of knew, uh, you know, once I sold it, it was no longer necessarily my baby. You know, it was going to be somebody else's uh, responsibility to call the shots at the end of the day. And And, you know, over the last few years, I wasn't real happy with the direction that they were going. You know, they had their reasons to do it. I can't fault them. Uh, it just wasn't really what I had in mind, you know. So by the time I left, uh, by the time we split ways, you know, it, it, it was kind of less, I guess, disappointing than it would have been years earlier, just because, like, it didn't necessarily feel like, you know, my website anymore, you know. But like I said, I, I've got a lot of fond memories. A lot of my good friends uh, still work there. I wish the best for them. But, you know, I'm excited to do something new and, and start this new venture. Mm. I was going to say, Dan, we've seen a lot of sites come and go. We've seen a, a lot of quality people give up on their dream of working in MA media spaces, you know, whether it's podcasters, writers, interviewers, you know, what do you think it sort of takes to be able to make a spot for yourself in MMA in, in 2019? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's tough. I think, you know, for to work at a site like uh, Junkie or, or uh, MMA Fighting or Bloody Elbow, um, it, it's good to be able to do a lot of different things. You know, when we would send someone to an event uh, to go cover an event for MMA Junkie, a lot of times they were doing interviews, they were taking photos, they were even shooting video, uh, doing stuff on social media. Um, I, I think there's always going to be a need for kind of the jack of all trades who, who can jump on and, and do a lot of things. Um, you know, one of the first guys I kind of identified who who could do a little of everything and, and do it pretty well was a, a assistant editor at MMA Junkie, Matt Erickson. Uh, you know, good photographer, good writer, good editor. Uh, he was on our radar for a long time. We really wanted him just because I know I knew he could kind of step into so many roles. Uh, I think that's still going to be the case in a lot of places. And, um, you know, kind of I think one of the fun developments is seeing a place like uh, The Athletic where, you know, we don't have to ball down a, a guy like Ben Folks doing, you know, individual fight recaps on a fight night. Um, you know, he can do what he really does best, which is working on these longer form features and, and uh, you know, taking some time to develop columns and, and you know, kind of his unique spin on stuff. So um, I, I think for the younger ones, you know, it, it's always going to be good to know Photoshop, to know video editing, to have really strong writing and editing skills. Um, you know, I think eventually you could probably now you know, move up to a, a place like The Athletic if you're really focused on uh, writing, if that's really what you want to do. But uh, honestly, I think there's always going to be kind of editor, managing editor, assistant editor roles uh, for guys who can do a little of everything. So I, I think advice to young guys is just, you know, get as much experience as you can, uh, whether it's writing or photography or video. The, the more stuff that you can do, uh, the more likely you are to find a home where, where someone needs somebody like you. Uh, I was going to ask Dan also, You've got all these really, really talented writers, and I think a lot of people would come to sort of, you know, the, the individual websites that they were formerly known uh, for being with to sort of check out their columns, whether it's pre-fight, post-fight. How exactly does it work, and how exactly does it get divvied up? Because you guys are obviously going to be covering UFC 238 this weekend, and, uh, you know, you've got all these... You get, you're going to have all these great articles, I imagine, from, you know, Chuck Mendenhall, Chanel Shadi, Fernando Prides, Chad Dennis, Josh Gross, and... and, and Ben Folks, but is is everybody kind of going to be giving their takes? Is it all going to be completely opinion based, or is it going to be kind of, um, I guess, split up where people will have their own individual roles uh, in, in the website that they'll be known for? How, how exactly is it going to be uh, working? Yeah, I think kind of you know what the guys did well before. For the most part, they'll be doing a, a lot of that same stuff. But I, I think a lot of you know most of the well, all of the guys and and Fernando. Uh, you know, they, they've got kind of their strong points. And, and thankfully, I think uh, a lot of the skills that, that that our writing team has now, they kind of complement what everybody else is doing. Uh, someone like Josh Gross is, is really good at kind of regulatory affairs, uh, the sports history, um, you know, uh, officiating, things like that. Uh, Ben's really good, just kind of at pure features, uh, uh, sharp analysis, and, and Chad and uh, 
Chad done this is kind of the same way. Um, you know, we kind of, I think, you know, figured out early on that Sean and uh, Chuck would probably be uh, guys who would be really good for on-site stuff, kind of capturing or capturing the the sights and, and sounds of of a fight week and, and turning out smart columns and, and kind of summarizing what's going on on fight week and the fallout of fight week. So uh, thankfully, kind of everybody's really strong points, um, I, I think, complement each other well. Uh, we kind of have a system in place. If there's a story, you know, you really want to do and, and you think other people may want to do it. Uh, it's kind of first come first serve. So, uh, you know, um, you know, everyone's kind of calling dibs on stuff they want to know. Thankfully there hasn't been, you know, too much overlap. Uh, so I think we'll, you know, I think we're going to have enough freedom and, and latitude that these guys, uh, and, and Fernanda can, you know, really do what they do, uh, what they do well, they're going to have the opportunity to do it. Um, you know, we're just not going to bog them down with kind of the day-to-day -day stuff, the stuff that they really don't want to do. Um, it, it's going to be a lot of really good long reform features really playing into their strengths. So I think we're already seeing it, you know, we're two days in, I think we've gotten some really cool content. We've got a lot of stuff scheduled, you know, even weeks in advance. So, uh, if you like the writer's work, if you read them before, I think you're going to really like what they're doing now. Cause we're going to give them the, the time and resources to really work on the features that maybe they didn't have before. Mm. I think I saw on social media, you mentioned that it's good to be working with, you know, talented but also good people people that you know that are nice to work with you know good personality someone that you can gel with is it is it kind of crazy to have i suppose such a group of nice talented people together and does it make you think back to days where you know you've been in situations in the industry and in other jobs where you've had to sort of work with you know talented but sort of unpleasant people and sort of having to make that work yeah, I mean, I'm very thankful. I, I've probably really only, only had, you know, three or four, like, real career jobs, and, and I'm almost, or over 40 now. So, uh, and during that time, I've really never worked with anybody that I, I just couldn't stand or, or couldn't get along with. And I know that's really rare, um, you know, so to have this opportunity with The Athletic and, and work with guys that I consider, you know, really good friends and, and colleagues and, and guys and, and, and girls I look up to, um, I, I know it's rare. I don't take it for granted. And, and thankfully, the, the athletic was kind of smart enough from the get go. Um, or, you know, they basically said, is there anybody you don't want to work with? Is there anybody you think that the other writers would have a problem working with? And, you know, I think one of the good things, you know, covering MMA, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of people in our industry that, you know, are just kind of universally hated or, or that, that, you know, have no social skills or, or don't know how to work in a team. Um, but thankfully, you know, uh, that some of the names that the athletic presented to me were guys that, you know, I've known either I've worked with or, or you know, covered events with, you know, from from other websites. And, and I just I knew it'd be a really good team that got along well. And, and we're already seeing it uh, with the athletic. Uh, it's not only that everybody gets along really well, it's it's that they feed off each other really well. Um, you know, we can start brainstorming ideas. And, and by the time everybody's weighed in, we've got a really sharp kind of polished idea. Um, and when you've got someone on your staff that, uh, you know, isn't really a team player, you know, is focused kind of more on themselves than the team. Um, I, I don't think you get your best stuff. And, and thankfully, you know, I don't think that's something we're going to have to worry about. We've got, you know, pros who, who not only can do a good job, but they, they really know how to work with other people and other writers and, and bring out the best in them. I'm very excited about this, Dan. Uh, this all sounds incredible. Uh, just quickly, before we let you go, UFC 238, of course, this weekend. So we want to get your thoughts on a couple of things. Um, one of them being, obviously, we're still very, very early in this UFC on ESPN sort of pay-per-view stream, or ESPN Plus, I should say, pay-per-view streaming deal. And um, obviously, some of the you know earlier ones, UFC 237, maybe not doing the biggest numbers. I wonder what you think this one will do in terms of numbers, just because looking at it, it is a very, very deep card top to bottom. Uh, but in the in the main fights, the main co-main fights, you have some uh, you have people that aren't necessarily known for being the biggest draws. It's it's a very good fight from it's, it's a very good card from the hardcore fans standpoint. Maybe not so much from the casual fans. What are you expecting this one to do in terms of numbers, Dan? Yeah, I mean, my, I think my expectations would be pretty modest, even, you know, kind of without the the hurdles of, of the way the U or the ESPN pay-per-views work now. Yeah. Even if it were kind of on the, the traditional platform, I, I, you know, 
I, I think, you know, like I said, it, it'd be pretty modest. Um, but also kind of like you said, I think it's also going to be one of those cards that people are buzzing about the next day. There's just so many yeah. kind of good matchups and, and good names. And uh, when, when Tony Ferguson and Donald Cerrone have third billing on a card, you, you know, yeah. it's going to be a pretty good card. But, you know, you go down deep into the prelims and, and you see some pretty big names, you know, Sterling versus Munoz. Um, you know, Joanne Calderwood and the, the curtain jerker, Ricardo Lamas buried in the prelims. I mean, there's going to be some really good fights there. And I, I, I think maybe there it would be one that they get a lot more kind of last minute buys just because the prelims are, are so good and get people buzzing it and get, you know, uh, kind of take over social media. And those people who were on the fence now all of a sudden are making a, a last minute purchase. So I, I still don't think it's going to do huge numbers, but I do think it's going to be a really fun card. Hmm. I was thinking about this the other day and I was sort of talking to a lot of casual friends that I'm friends with. And it does, it doesn't really seem like they know that Tony Ferguson is fighting Cowboy Cerrone on this card. And then I was thinking about it. Obviously this fight sort of came together pretty quickly Tony Ferguson isn't really in a position where he's doing a lot of interviews. So I guess this media week is where we'll really start reading about it a little bit more. But do you feel like this card is sort of uh, this this big fight is kind of being swept under the rug a little bit? I feel like everybody I speak to forgets about the fact that Tony Ferguson is fighting Cowboy Cerrone this weekend. I feel like a lot of people think it's down the road or in another card. Now people are realizing how quickly this fight has come together and when it's happening. No, I, I think that's a really good point. I, and I was kind of in the boat up until a few weeks ago where I was thinking it was kind of a, a midsummer card and, and not coming up so quickly. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are going to be in that boat. And I think once kind of the media day stuff really gets rolling, uh, you know, it, it's going to remind people and it'll be like, oh, crap, that, that this is really a card I need to tune into. Uh, but, yeah, it, is, it has kind of flown under the radar, uh, which is unfortunate. I, you know, it also kind of bugs me that this isn't a five round fight, you know, that it, it's not mm, a main event. Yeah. But I think it's one that maybe a, a so so pay per view event, you stick a, a, a fight like this in, in the middle of the main card, and, and now you really feel like you're getting your money's worth. So I think that could help, you know, with some last minute pay per view bias too. But yeah, it, it's surprising kind of how this fight's flown under the radar. But I think it's really going to pick up steam here in the next few days, and fans are going to get excited. Yeah, I mean, media day is going to be fascinating just to get that, you know, early glimpse of Tony Ferguson. What, what are you expecting from him in this fight? Because he, he's typically a guy who really benefits from a long preparation and a long training camp. And as we just mentioned, this one kind of came together rather quickly. And I, I feel like it's a big mystery. It's a big X factor how long Tony's actually been training for this fight and also how much some of those personal issues with his family affected his training and you know whether it derailed him in any way and whether whether we will get the usual tony ferguson when he takes on cowboy serrani yeah i mean i i don't like that he's coming back so quickly kind of after dealing with some mental health issues and and we really don't know the extent of it but uh obviously it it, it sounded pretty serious and I don't think the UFC is doing any favors one rushing him back so quickly and two against a guy like donald serrani mm. um you know, you know, I, I don't want to make light of the situation, but it's also, you know, even if it were a totally normal week for Tony Ferguson, and it's so hard to read his personality and stuff. Just he, yeah. he's such a kind of character and and he did dude. I, I think if he comes to, to fight week and seems totally normal all week, that that's probably the the the, the time to panic because he yeah. doesn't seem like normal. So, um, but I, I really hope he's in a good place. I, I really hope he's you know, near 100%, despite kind of the, the short notice, because if you get kind of uh, prime or peak Donald Cerrone versus prime peak uh, Tony Ferguson, that's one hell of a fight. It, it, it's one hell of a matchup. And I just don't want it to be, you know, the type of thing where the fight's over and it's like, well, clearly Ferguson wasn't really ready to come back so quickly. And, mm. and maybe that was a mistake because one, it's going to, you know, kind of, uh, take a bit away from a, a possible cowboy win. Um, but it's also going to put Ferguson in a, a really odd spot where, you know, what do you do with him then? So, um, you know, I, I, I pay a lot of attention to the fights. Uh, Tony Ferguson's a pretty decent favorite. I think the last I saw was minus 140, which, you know, considering kind of the, the past few months and, and the uh, kind of some of the chaotic, you know, uh, stuff that's been going on in his life, I, I was actually surprised to see him as a small favorite, but, you know, it just makes me wonder that, you know, if he were 
hadn't been dealing with those issues and stuff, would he be a minus 200 favorite? But it's just, you know, I, I think for the most part, based on the odds and the, the betting public, I think they assume we're going to see kind of the same old Tony Ferguson we've seen before. But man, Donald Cerrone is just, he, he's streaking so well. When he's on, he's on. And it, it seems like he's in a, a kind of a, a sweet spot of his career. So I, I'm, I'm just really excited to see this fight. I just, I hope three rounds aren't over and we were really wishing we had those two other rounds. But, you know, regardless, this is a, a, a fight to get excited about. Mm, no, that's a great point. And I want to get your thoughts about the Valentina Jessica I fight in just a second. But um, just curious, from your perspective as the ma managing editor, it's always tricky. I mean, me and Casper have been a part of some interesting fight weeks where a person's personal life is sort of a big part of a of the story coming in. And when it comes to Tony Ferguson, you mentioned it, you know, there could be some mental issues, maybe even some issues with his brain from the constant fighting. As, as managing editor for The Athletic, where do you draw the line um, when you talk to sort of your st team and staff about how big of a part is that going to be of their coverage? And also some of the lines of questioning when it comes to Tony Ferguson, because at one, at one side of things, it seems like, you know, just focus on the fight. He's back. He looks healthy. Let's just focus on his strategy and his training and stuff like that. On the other side of things, you know, this is a guy that could be, you know, maybe not as healthy as we think he is. Maybe he's going through some things and that could be a big part of his story as well going into this fight. Yeah, it's tough. We, we, you know, a couple of the writers tried to get some time with uh, Tony the, the past week or two, um, you know, so we could try to find this stuff out. Um, you know, he, he just, you know, didn't want to do the media, which, you know, I, I guess I understand. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of wish, you know, whether it was us or, or other media outlets, I, I wish he would have done a little more media. Um, you know, I like for that kind of stuff to be addressed before fight week, you know, mm. we can cover we can get the story out there. And then on fight week, we can focus on the fights. Uh, now it kind of puts us in a, you know, any reporter and kind of an awkward position where not only do you need to, to cover the fight itself, but you, you kind of need to cover the, you know, what's going on in his personal life and where he's at mentally and emotionally and stuff. And, you know, we don't do it to, you know, uh, kind of dig up the past or, or make him look bad, but, you know, a, a sport like this is so unforgiving that you're not really doing your job as a journalist or, or even doing a service to your readers if you don't address that stuff. So I, I'm hoping he, you know, we can get some answers and that he addresses it earlier in the week. And then, you know, we can kind of move past it and, and you know, talk about the fight itself and, and start breaking that down. But, you know, I think, you know, throughout the week, regardless of what happens, it's a major storyline uh, of this fight and, and you know I, I think it's all but impossible to ignore it you know obviously we're not going to dwell on it or or uh, you know try to take advantage of it but like I said you, you're really not doing your job if you just pretend that issue isn't there mm, absolutely I, I can already picture it now the Tony Ferguson media scrum is going to be the hot ticket at uh, at this week's media day um, Jessica I takes on Valentina Shevchenko, obviously for the UFC's women's flyweight title. Uh, we saw we saw Andrew Ruiz upset Anthony Joshua this past weekend, and I think people are kind of seeing Valentina Shevchenko to pretty clearly win this fight. How big of an upset do you think it would be, uh, and sort of you know in in some of the biggest MMA upsets of all time, if Jessica I was able to go in there and uh, defeat Valentina? Yeah, uh, Sean uh, Shante. Uh, he actually did a, a story on this that we've got running on the athletic tomorrow where he kind of looked at the lopsided nature of this fight. I mean, if, if you go to bed on this fight right now, you know, Valentina is anywhere from a 13 to 20 to one favorite, which is wow. just kind of astronomical. And, you know, in a sport where anything can happen, it, it's really rare to get, you know, kind of lopsided odds like that. I mean, I think the issue with the fight is, you know, I got nothing against Jessica. I, I think she, she beats, you know, a, a lot of, women in, in her weight class and, and she has but I, I think even at 13 to 1 odds there's probably still value in, in betting on Valentina just because I, I think it's such a there's such a disparity between you know what they can do and and you know you mentioned Ruiz and and I think that's a good point that you know it's even more so than boxing and MMA uh, anything can happen but you know the problem with this guy is you know besides a, a freak injury or, or flash knockdown down or, or knockout or something like that 
I, I just don't see what that anything is that, that could happen mm. to, to have her win this fight. Um, again, that's not taking anything away from her. I think anyone uh, in that division, just about anyone would be a huge underdog like she is. But, um, you know, she she's definitely got an uphill battle ahead of her. That's not to say she can't do it. But I think the odds are as lopsided as they are for a very good reason. Mm. Give us your take on this uh, Henry Cejudo, uh, Marlon Marais fight for the Bantamweight title. I mean, it's interesting because Cejudo's had an incredible run, but Marais has just been an absolute killer in the division. I mean, it's, it's really hard to gauge where Marais' sort of ceiling is when it comes to his skills and what he's able to do in this fight, which makes it such a fun one because even though you'd think that Cejudo has a good shot of winning it because he beat TJ Dillashaw and Demetrius Johnson. You know, Marais is quite a big guy, and this is bantamweight. So there's always different factors that come in there when this fight got put together. He's also super intense and has a lot of pressure that he brings uh, as an amazing striker. How do you sort of see this fight going? Are you still leaning towards Cejudo in this one, or do you think Marais has a genuine shot here of winning the title? Yeah, I actually spent a decent amount of time kind of, you know, reading up on this fight and, and kind of looking at all the intangibles before we spoke. And um, it, it's one of those things where if you really start for, uh, focusing on Marlon, you're like, oh, OK, I, I totally see him winning. Then you start focusing, it, focusing on Henry <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, I totally can see him winning. There's just so much stuff that both these guys do so well. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, the size uh, difference is going to be. Uh, substantial enough or enough of a factor where I, I don't think you have to worry about that too much. I, I think it really is going to come down to their, their skills. I, I think kind of the wild card for me is just seeing how much Henry still improves fight to fight and how quickly he picks up on everything. Um, you know, obviously it, it's almost a running joke at this point that, you know, uh, of course he's an Olympic gold medalist and, and everyone knows that too, but it's such a huge part of his game. It just makes it so much easier for him to do everything else uh, in the uh, in a fight. Um, you know, I, I think for me, if Mar Marlon kind of goes back to those leg kicks that we used to see in World Series of Fighting when he would just, you know, kind of hobble guys, um, I, I think that could quickly turn the, the fight in his favor. But then I'm like, well, Henry's got some really good low kicks these days, too. So. Um, I don't know. I, at the sports book right now, Marlon's, a, a, I think, a minus 130 favorite. Uh, Henry's a, a small underdog. I, you know, if I were setting the line or, or what I think, I would actually probably flip those odds. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I were forced to, to put 20 bucks on this fight, I'd probably lean toward Henry. But um, there, there's just so many different ways this fight could go. These guys are so talented. There's so many different ways they can win. Um, you know, as a fight fan and a journalist, these are the types of fights I, I get really excited about. Uh, two high-level guys, and you just don't know how the fight's going to go. So it's hard not to get excited about this one. Absolutely. It's going to be a fun fight, kind of, course. I'm looking forward to the great coverage from The Athletic. You can check it out at theathletic.com. There you go, guys. He's the managing editor for theathletic.com. Go on there, subscribe today. And don't miss out on any of the great things coming up for the website. And Dan, you know, you, 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 we said it at the start of the interview, you are MMA royalty. You are an OG, obviously the co-founder of MMA Junkie. So it is, it is an absolute pleasure and honor to finally have you on the program and be able to chat to you. Thank you so much. You guys have been kicking ass the past few years and, and really made a name for yourself. It's been awesome to see. So it's really a pleasure to come on. I appreciate it. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. What's up, fight fans? I'm the interim title that never gets a unification battle of mixed martial arts, Tommy Toehold. And it's finally June. Things are heating up here in the U.S. That means the fights are heating up as well, which means I'm here yet again to tell you why you need to be watching UFC 238 this weekend. And honestly, this one sells itself, and I'm going to sell it anyway. First of all, you got two title fights, the main event of which could very well be crowning another double champ. The first double champ to receive two of those new belts that look like they belong in a Star Wars movie. Henry Cejudo, did you know he won an Olympic gold medal? He's trying for that elusive second strap after his first defense of his flyweight title against the bantamweight champion TJ Dillashaw. But it's not a rematch at bantamweight. TJ's in timeout for a while. So in his place, he's taking on One Punch Man Marlon Marais for the vacant bantamweight strap. And One Punch Man is a very, very fitting comparison. Marais has three first round finishes in his last three fights. This dude's a wrecking ball painted to look like a human. The fight has classic written all over it. Cejudo is the king of cringe, but he's also a king of the cage. A win here probably shoots him past Habib on the pound for pound list. That puts him in 
John Jones, Daniel Cormier territory, or maybe he goes down that list. Maybe he'll be viciously stopped by the Magic Man. It's a strong matchup. Either way, Ali Abdelaziz wins because he's managing both of them. In the co-main event, we've got Valentina Shevchenko. The bullet has finally found some gold. It feels like it's been way too long, but she's got her own division now. She just took it to Joanna Violets. Nobody's been able to touch her besides the double champ Amanda Nunes. She might end up being Flyweight's Fedor. I'm gonna call her Flydor. Her first test is Machine Gun Kelly's favorite, Jessica I, coming straight out of Las Vegas via Cleveland. She's got her own gym now. Her UFC run at Bantamweight was a disaster. Five losses and seven fights, one win overturned for pot of all things. Everyone was thinking she's dead in the water, career is over. Boom, she moves back to Flyweight when the UFC finally makes the division. She goes on a three fight run and now she might become champion of the fucking world against one of the toughest fighters out there. If that's not a compelling story, I don't know what is. I cannot wait to see what happens in that one. And that is just the main event and the co-main event. I haven't even talked to you guys about the feature bout. It might as well be a title fight. The title of fighter who gives the least fucks in the world. Donald Cerrone is taking on Tony Ferguson. This is a fucking dream fight. El Kakui is on an 11 fight run. Match it up with just about anybody else's in MMA. You're not going to find many better. Six stoppages in his last eight as well. Ferguson is the uncrowned king of lightweight. He should have fought for the title two years ago. He is the biggest question mark by far, hanging over Habib Nurmagomedov's head. But before he finally gets his chance at the gold, he's going to have to go through a renewed surging cowboy Cerrone. This motherfucker had a kid and now he's on one of the best comeback runs in MMA history with four losses in his last five late into 2018. The words gatekeeper and retirement were starting to be thrown around. Cowboy fucks up Mike Perry, goes to lightweight, beats the living shit out of a strong up and comer in Alexander Hernandez, and then absolutely brutalizes a top contender in Ally Aquinta. Suddenly Cowboy looks fucking unstoppable. He's got the most wins in UFC history. He's got the most stoppages. He's got the most bonuses. The only thing that's eluded him is that title. And if he stops Tony Ferguson's unbeaten streak, that is exactly what he's going to get next. Honestly, could the stakes be any fucking higher in all three of those bouts? Those three fights alone are more than enough hype for you to buy 238. But then you run down the rest of the card, it's like, holy shit, Jimmy Rivera's back. Tai Tuivasa is probably going to drink a beer out of a shoe. Nina Ansarov and Tatiana Suarez are going to see who's going to be next at strawweight. Aldo and Pedro Munoz, Carolina Kovokovic and Alexa Grasso, Ricardo Lamas, Angela Hill, Jojo Calderwood. There's just so much to fucking love on this card. I mean, how in the world can you not? From top to bottom, this thing's stacked up with interesting fighters and interesting fights. What more could you possibly want out of MMA? I can't fucking wait. I bet you can't either. I'm sure we're all gonna watch it together and have a great time. That's all I got. The hype has been hyped. Submission Radio, you're the best. Thank you again for having me on the show. Let's do this shit! This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is known for his excellent work at ESPN, where he's been killing it for the longest time. You can, of course, see him on select UFC broadcast, preview shows, and post-fight shows. He also is a frequent feature in our dreams. Who could forget the image of him at the UFC 234 Open Workouts? Blue polo, backwards hat, silky smooth voice. He's the James Bond of MMA. Brett Okamoto, welcome back to Smish Radio. How's that for an intro? Man, always the best intros. You know, I thought I, I thought the whole James Bond thing started at MSG, though, when we were sitting in your little studio kind of, uh, yeah. kind of area and all of our legs were touching because it was quite a small area and we were on high chairs. <laughs> I, I thought that's kind of where the James Bond thing began, but it was in Australia, huh? Well, you know, there's lots of different elements to our dreams, Brett, so maybe that's a separate one. But, that has to add, but I, I still definitely do dream about those days at MSG. So thank you so much for joining us. And you look like a beautiful soul, a ghost that's come down from heaven to talk to us about the big card UFC 238 this coming weekend in Chicago. So let's kick it off with probably the most looked forward to fight on the card, Tony Ferguson versus Donald Cerrone. First off, considering the possible opponents for Ferguson since UFC 229, Max Holloway even recently, what do you think about Cerrone being the guy that he finally returns against and on this card of all cards? Um, I mean, I think uh, I think Tony really wanted one of two guys. You know, he wanted Conor McGregor, he wanted Khabib. And uh, unfortunately, you know, his inability to take that fight against Max Holloway for that interim title um, because that's typically how it works, right? And I mean, we can come up with different exceptions historically where this didn't work out. But once you get that interim title, you know, I know, I know a lot of fans are like, what's, what's an interim title? We're sick of interim titles. But for the fighters themselves, it, it, there is a lot of value in holding an interim title. It affects your, your contract. But it also is that, that really rare guarantee that you're next, you know, or it should be. And again, we can come up with examples of maybe when it wasn't. But by and large, when you have that interim championship, that demands a unification belt. Um, so, 
Tony, had he been able to fight Max Holloway in Atlanta, you know, he could have set himself up with that sort of uh, that guarantee that he was going to get um, that next crack. And unfortunately, you know, because of personal issues, he wasn't able to take it. Well, now, you know, Dustin Poirier was able to take it. And you can't you really can't take that opportunity away from Dustin Poirier. So um, Connor's not fighting. Khabib is tied up. So I think, you know, Tony was in a place where he wanted to fight. Um, he, he was in shape. He was ready to come back. The UFC looked at the Chicago card and said, you know what? This is a really deep card top to bottom. I think, um, you know, the three of us sitting here would agree that this is one of the, the, the cards that I've been most excited about just from a, a top to bottom depth standpoint all year. But it was lacking sort of that that real signature fight that you can hang your hat on. Mm. The UFC recognized that and said, hey, Tony Ferguson coming back. That's the signature fight that you can hang your hat on. And then um, Cowboys is a crazy person that uh, agrees to every fight that uh, is thrown at him. So I think that's just how we got here. Oh, absolutely. And I think this fight will definitely be drawing people to the card. Just looking at the analytics in the U- UFC YouTube, I think the countdown from Ferguson, Serrani was close to 800,000 when I last looked, and Cejudo's uh, countdown was like around 200,000. So it's definitely doing big things for him. Just quickly, you mentioned contract negotiations and what it means for. Uh, if you become an interim champion, you reported, you know, some news earlier on about how uh, Khabib's got a new contract that Ali said that he's got this new deal and, you know, he's happy with the deal. It's a big deal. And there's also a clause for a GSP. I'm just curious with the way the pay-per-views work for the UFC and sort of ESPN paying that uh, sort of flat sum per pay-per-view, what, what kind of, perks can a champion have in their contract now i know before you used to get pay-per-view points and that was a big deal but would you have any sort of idea or clue as to like what what are some of the benefits that ufc can offer to some of these champions in these contracts like it could be for example i mean i think a higher base pay you know it all it all starts there and uh yeah i mean the conversations that i'm having with with managers and with fighters themselves is they're aware of that you know um i think that they the, the whole sport as a whole is pretty optimistic and pretty positive about um, the UFC moving to ESPN. And, you know, it's, it's a big spotlight here in the U.S. Um, it's, 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 where, it's where the sport should be just in terms of, of generating eyeballs and, and being accepted. But, you know, because it is the only place where you can buy the pay-per-view here now in the States, it does affect, at least in the short term, uh, um, you know, or should have an impact on, 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 the, on the purchasing rates. And a lot of these contracts you know, that are pre-existing were written with that idea in mind is that, you know, hey, um, we get paid more depending on how the pay-per-view performs. And if, if uh, you know, all of a sudden the game changes a little bit on you, you know, is that uh, we, we made these contracts uh, under the assumption of certain things and now those things have changed. So, you know, Ali told me that, that there was definitely a, um, a focus on, on a higher flat rate, you know, guaranteed pay. And I think that that is... It's pretty obvious when you think about it. I mean, that's that's what guys are going to be asking for. That's what managers want. Um, and then, you know, with certain guys like Khabib and then, you know, the, the, the part about the, the George St. Pierre clause, there's still going to be certain fights where you hope and you expect them to do very well on pay-per-view. And I think that, um, you know, in a perfect world and perfect contract, these fighters, they won't want more guaranteed pay, but they also want, um, you know, the ability to say, hey, when there is a really special fight, and there is a real special rivalry or I've worked myself into a position in which, you know, now my name is selling, um, you know, above average pay-per-views that I want to be compensated for that as well. So I don't think it's it, it's it's to be expected. You know, the, the business has changed a little bit. I do think that it will, um, you know, right now it's, it's a really big focus because we've only had two pay-per-views so far that through this model where you can only purchase them on, on, them on ESPN as education. Um you know, as fans become more educated and then also this this becomes just more of a technology, technological norm where people are just used to buying pay-per-views on a streaming platform as opposed to traditional cable. I think that it will not be as big of a deal as it is right now, but certainly it is a big deal now because it was a, it was a big change in, in the um, in the landscape. And, and so you said it was uh, very fascinating there, Brett. So just to clarify the clause uh, in that contract for the GSP fight, it would be something around basically that if, if that fight does happen, that there will be more money earned through, uh, I guess, the revenue for that fight, correct? That was my understanding. You know, mm. Ali was, uh, I tried to get details out of him. Yeah. Give me details, you know, about, about the contract itself um, and then the clause itself. But that was my understanding, you know, is that 
that it's no secret. I mean, if you if you've been paying sort of any attention to what Ali and Khabib have been saying, you know, mm. for quite some time now, they want to fight George St. Pierre. Yeah, very very obvious that that is a big big fight for them. Um, they badly badly want it. They think it's still possible, even though George, you know, announced his retirement. And so, you know, take this for what it's worth. I mean, if, if this means that the UFC thinks that it's a really strong possibility, or they were just you know amusing. It could be even in, in Ali because this is something they really wanted to put in the contract. And UFC is like, sure, we can put this in the contract. But the way Ali made it sound is that they basically already negotiated a fight between George and Khabib. In the event that it happens, hmm. you know, they have an understanding of, of the financial terms of what that fight would look like. Mm. How fascinating. And imagine they did that with like an idea in the back of their head that that fight would never happen, but they just want to get this deal done. So, all right, we'll put the terms out there. Let's get this deal done. All right, well, let's talk about the fight, though, because obviously we know that uh, Tony Ferguson is a very dangerous guy. He can fight the finish anywhere, uh, the fight, finish the fight anywhere it goes. On his best day, his cardio and warrior spirit never runs out. He does take quite a bit of damage, though, and it usually has at least one scary moment in each fight, and Cerrone can certainly hurt him and make him pain. Also, Cerrone's currently on a good streak, coming in with a lot of momentum, and Tony's had to deal with a lot of adversity. You know, we saw there were some personal issues. He sort of had to deal with a lot of backlash from media and fans. How do you feel these guys match up, especially in this, you know, in this time right now in both of their lives? Yeah, I mean, this would already be a fascinating fight if none of that stuff was was going on. And then you add just wrinkle after wrinkle to it. And there are really wrinkles that like us as as journalists and as sports pundits, if you want to call it that, or experts or whatever, just people sitting on their couch who watch a lot of fighting, whatever you consider yourself to be. These are just hard things to quantify. You know, I mean, what what is what is the effect going to be on Tony Ferguson of whatever he went through over the last um, you, you know, whatever it was, six to seven months. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of us read the reports, but the, the reports are a very, very brief glimpse into, you know, whatever happened between he and his family, between he and his personal life. Um, how's it going to affect him? It's, it's really, really difficult to say. You know, I mean, I would say that even when Tony fought Anthony Pettis last October, I, I was saying to myself, there's no way Tony is going to be the Tony that we completely remember, there's no way he's going to be absolutely 100% coming back from a knee injury that mm. that quickly. You know what I mean? When he was saying things like doctors are telling me it's going to take 10 months and I'm going to I'm going to do it in four. It's like that doesn't sound healthy. Tony, you know? <laughs> yeah. then, he went out, then he went out and he, and he still looked like Tony Ferguson. So it, those types of things that I mean, it really is just speculation on our part. Uh, how is he how is he going to look um, after what he's been through this year? You know, the Cowboy Cerrone thing is fascinating, and I'm a believer in the dad thing. I really am. I think that the dad thing has 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 done something in Cowboy, and, and if nothing else, it's really it has made him care about his legacy more, and it has made him really want to win a title. And I think that those are important things. But I also kind of look around the sport, and I say there are plenty of dads in this sport, and not mm. all of them are winning, are going on win streaks and winning championships. So I'm not going to pick Donald Cowboy Cerrone in a, in a fight against another top five guy because he happens to be a new dad. You know, that I, I just, me personally, that's not something I'm going to truly buy into. Although, I, like I said, I do think that it, it deserves to be taken into account, but how much, you know, and that, yeah. all of that is to like give you a, a long winded answer that I don't have an answer for you. I just, <laughs> just, like I said, this is a fascinating stylistic fight to begin with. I agree that Tony Ferguson allows himself to get hit um, a lot and he almost seems to get better when he allows himself to get hit but that yeah. type of strategy and that type of fighting style that has an expiration date on it and when you hit the expiration date on it it can look pretty bad you know and there's really no coming back from it when when it expires so you never know when it's going to expire and Donald Cerrone is a big time finisher so I think this is a dangerous fight for Tony but I also think he's the favorite for a reason I mean his style and the pace that he sets and the fact that sometimes Cowboy does get off to slow starts and this is a three-round fight, I do favor Tony, but because of all of these different um, factors and variables that we really just can't put much value on, I don't know. It's a tough fight to pick. Hmm. Do you feel like uh, Serrani's performance against the incredibly tough ally Quinta is something that sort of raised his stock to the point that a lot of people are kind of being like, well, I don't know what's going to happen? Because I feel like before the Al fight, Everybody obviously knew Cerrone was dangerous, but a lot of people sort of felt like a lot of his best days were behind him. Whereas now, I feel like after that performance, people are like, hey, this guy can legitimately be one of the best guys in the division. 
Yeah, definitely. Because I think when when Cowboy decided to go back to 155 in January and he beat um, Alex Hernandez, as impressed as we all were, there was a small part, I think, in a lot of us that, that sort of said, you know, that was give give Cowboy credit. But also it, it kind of seemed like Alex wasn't quite ready for it. You know, I mean, he, he tried to poke the bear in Cowboy a little <laughs> bit. And and uh, and then you could just see it that, that uh, you know, Cowboy's veteran experience uh, it, it counted in that fight, you know, but then when he went up against Al, it was like, OK, well, now it's Al. It's a pretty quick turnaround for a guy of Donald Cowboy's age. He's got to cut all that weight. You know, he is a huge 155 er. So you wondered about, you know, he came back and cut that weight to 155 for the first time in years in January. Now he's going to turn around and do it again pretty quickly, get into a camp right away. It's going to be a five round fight. I mean, I really thought that if that fight crept into the fourth and fifth rounds that Al Iaquinta was going to have a pretty significant advantage. And then it was the exact opposite. You know, Cowboy looked like he was just warming up in the fourth and fifth rounds. So, um, yes, I do think that the Cowboys performance against Al Iaquinta has a lot more people that like had that, that fight never happened. And we had just gone to the Tony fight. I think a lot of people would be counting Cowboy out. But now after seeing that, uh, I think the dad, the dad Cowboy, <laughs> people are believers and uh and cowboys got some some support in this one yeah and i mean looking at the stakes here you've got khabib Nurmagomedov taking on dustin poirier at ufc 242 so what do you think the winner of this fight serenia ferguson does do you think they sit out and wait and sort of fight the, the whoever the champ is after abu dhabi and i, I just have to say n- n- not to say that we have any bias here or anything but how devastating do you think it would be for Tony Ferguson to come out here, take this risky fight, and then lose and not get that title shot after you know already amassing such an incredible win streak? Yeah. Man, I mean, I would love to sit here and say that the winner of this fight is going to be guaranteed a title fight, but Dana White was yeah. on Sports Center today and was asked about Conor McGregor facing Habib Nurmagomedov, and they said, hey, could that happen? And I believe his exact words were, absolutely it could happen, you know, <laughs> and... and and it shouldn't surprise any of us. I mean, that is the biggest fight that the UFC can put together still, is, is that rematch between Habib and Connor. And so, you know, assuming Habib is able to get past Dustin Poirier and Connor's still sitting around and waiting, I mean, I think that his trolling skills and his, his fight promotion skills are not quite what they used to be, but they're still very good, you know. And if you give a guy like Connor an opportunity to, you know, start drumming up some interest on social media or, or creating some storylines that are tied to Habib, I mean, who knows, by the time we hit November in New York or that card at the end of the year in Las Vegas, we could be seeing that rematch. I mean, I personally, that's not what I'd I'd vote for, but um, it's definitely a possibility. Mm. Let's look at this title fight between Valentina Shevchenko and Jessica I for the UFC flyweight title. What do you think this fight says about the division? It's clearly in its early stages, but people are already expecting a very dominant win from Valentina Shevchenko much like they did against Nico Montana. And there aren't really exactly many title challenges in line next. And it's also kind of funny that this division just started. Meanwhile, the man's flyweight division looks like it's about to end. Um, What what do you make of all this? Well, I mean, I make that exactly like you said, that this is a new division. So it's not shocking to me that there's not really a whole long list of like established contenders because – you know, if, if you're if you're doing well at straw weight, then you're not going to immediately probably jump to 125. You know, I mean, you may, um, depending on where you see a potential opportunity. But if you're doing well, you're probably going to stay where you're at. Right. And that goes for bantamweight as well. So what you're getting is I don't want to say the middle tier of both divisions, but you're getting women who are looking for opportunities, you know, who are looking for maybe a fresh start. And you're combining that with an extremely dangerous, nearly perfect champion in Valentine. Tina Shevchenko. So what, what do you get when you combine those two? You get a lot of mismatches, quite frankly. And I think that, that that's probably going to be the case for a little bit. But as we've seen with the sport, it's dangerous to assume those types of things, you know. And, and I do think that this this division is not going to take long to settle in. And it's not going to take long for, for various female fighters to, you know, to move around or, or, or to, to, to seek out opportunities. It's not going to take a long time where we're just going through, I think, this this long era of of Valentina is fighting people that, that we really don't want to see her fight against. You know, I mean, I think there's going to be some of that, of course, because I do think that she has the opportunity to be such a dominant champion to the point of like a Demetrius Johnson effect where she almost makes it look too easy. But, um, 
I think it's going to improve, you know, because the, the, the division is still just so young. I mean, this is this is uh, Shevchenko's first title defense, you know. So let's give it a little bit of time. And then as far as, as this weekend, I think that Jessica I is not really the worst choice. I mean, she is a massive underdog for sure. And I don't expect her to win this fight. But at least at least she comes with that brash Cleveland style of like, mm-hmm. I don't care if no one believes in me. I believe in me. You know, this girl's not that bad. I mean, Jessica, I says that and she's pretty believable when she says it. So if nothing else, if that's all she can give us, then, um, you know, I'll take it right now because it's just hard to find Valentina Shevchenko a, a very competitive fight right now. For sure. There's another really exciting women's fight on this card. Um, I believe the card's so stacked now that it's been, it's been bumped down to the prelims, but you've got... Tatiana Suarez taking on Nina Ansarov in, in a massive fight for the uh, strawweight division. And, uh, you know, the, the UFC doesn't really do uh, title eliminators anymore, but this one does seem like one. I'm wondering if sort of, do you think this is one? Because you've also got Michelle Waterson sort of, you know, in, in, in the background campaigning for her own title shot. Tatiana Suarez obviously getting a big push from the UFC, did a media lunch uh, the other day in L.A., Need an answer of on a really impressive win streak as well, but I feel like I, I don't know if the promotion is really as behind her or sort of if the stakes are the same for her. What do you make of this one, Brett? Yeah, I agree with your assessment. Um, you know, if Nina goes in and, and, and surprises Tatiana, I think that the UFC can always switch gears pretty quickly and get behind her. Um, I mean, she does have the relationship, obviously, with Amanda Nunes, which is intriguing. I don't think that's, you know, that alone is going to. Um, you know, get people to buy pay-per-views, but at least it, it makes the story interesting, you know, and, and, and also it makes the story interesting is that Nina Ansaroff wanted to walk away from the sport, you know, and then she said, well, I'll just do one more. And then she mm. won it. And then she said, okay, I'll do one more. And then she won it. And then she said, all right, I'm going to ride this till the wheels fall off and the wheels haven't fallen off yet. <laughs> you know, so I think that, that Tatiana has some storylines to sell here, but it's, it should surprise nobody that, um, that all the focus seems to be on Tatiana. And th- there is good reason for that. You know, it's not just because, um, you know, because you, sometimes in combat sports, you see it where all, there's a lot of hype that's just kind of unwarranted. I don't think it's unwarranted with Tatiana Suarez. I mean, she fits into the mold of, uh, you know, the, the Ronda Rousey who was doing judo in her living room when she was a kid. And, and she fits into the same mold of, um, you know, Valentina Shevchenko starting Muay Thai when she was five years old. It, it's the same thing. But with Tatiana, it was wrestling. She started wrestling when she was three and a half. She wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist by the time she was 12 years old. She's just been wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. And she grew up on a mat. I mean, her, her brother says she was basically born on a wrestling mat. And if there's one thing that we know about this sport is when you see someone who has spent that amount of time in a combat sport, it is just, they are a matchup nightmare because they were just so good at that one thing. And we've seen that in Tatiana Suarez's fights. And so she, if she goes out and does that to Nina Ansarov on Saturday, there's really very little doubt in my mind that she's going to be the number one contender. And, and I think a fight between her and Jessica Andrade, even though it feels like it's, it's happening pretty quickly. I mean, I don't think any of us really thought it was going to happen this quick, uh, but that's a, that's a heck of a fight. I would be very, very mm. intrigued by that fight. Mm. Well, speaking of Olympic champions, Henry Cejudo moves back up to Bantuway to try and become UFC's fourth champ champ against Marlon Moraes. So he is on a crazy run right now, Brett. I mean, he beat Mighty Mouse, but then he beat an enhanced TJ Dillashaw. But how do you think he get, does against the taller Marlon Moraes, who's been absolutely destroying people in his last few fights and absolutely deserves a, a shot at the title after his impressive run? Yeah, I'm really pretty fascinated by this, actually, because when you look at there's two ways of looking at it, really. So Henry went out and beat arguably the greatest fighter of all time. And I know a lot of people will say, you're crazy. It's John Jones. It's George St. Pierre. I think, I think Demetrius Johnson is right in that conversation. Mm. Um, so he goes out and he beats, let's just say the greatest fighter of all time in Demetrius Johnson. And then, and then he fights uh, TJ Dillashaw, you know, who in my mind was a top five pound for pound fighter at the time. Um, really, uh, really dynamic, you know, well-rounded. Everybody knows how talented TJ Dillashaw mm-hmm. was, right? I don't need to, to sell you on that. Mm-hmm. So th- those are two enormous signature wins. And he did them pretty impressively. I mean, I know the, D- the DJ fight was close. It was a decision. Um, but any win over DJ is just so impressive. And just some of the scrambles and, and the things that he was able to accomplish in that fight, if you really just look at the details, you're like, man, Henry Cejudo is just darn good, you know? And then to go out and knock out TJ Dillashaw in the fashion he did, those are two really big statement wins. But at the same time, you can kind of make the case that, like, like, hey, Demetrius Johnson got injured early in that fight. 
And then he left the UFC, and you kind of get the feeling that, you know, not to say that he sandbagged it at all, but that, that maybe he, he, like, there was a small part, even subconsciously, that he was just done with the UFC. You know, that he didn't seem mm. too unhappy when he lost the belt, and then he could get out of there. Mm. And then with TJ, then we find out that on top of, of, of cutting all that weight and getting down to 125 pounds to a, a place in which his body may not have even been healthy. I mean, he was, he was enhanced I and mean, he was, he was using something that was driving him past, you know, levels that, that maybe not have been healthy. It may not have been the most healthy TJ Dillashaw walking in the octagon, even with the fact that he was using performance enhancing drugs. Maybe he was using them in such a way that he was actually depleted by the time he went in there. So on one hand, you can say these are the two greatest wins that Henry Cejudo has ever had. At the same time, you can kind of poke holes through them depending on how you want to look at them so i i I think that that is truly fascinating because now Mm. you've got henry you know going into a fight with a guy who's lesser known in marlon rice but i think probably you could make the case as his most difficult challenge because now he's facing a full size 35 or at 35 a guy who does not does not worry about pressure you know i mean i think right off the bat i I thought that if if, uh, henry cejudo beat tj dillashaw it'd be because he pressures him so well and he's so durable but if he tries to go in and pressure Marlon Marais and he's willing to take a shot, Marlon Marais will put him to sleep, you know? So I think that this stylistic matchup is just so fascinating. And there's a lot on the line for Henry Cejudo because even though he's got the Olympic be- uh, gold medal and he's got the belt and he's beat the former Bantamweight champion, I still don't think this guy qu- quite gets the uh, the credit that he deserves. And if he loses, um, you know, people are like, he, he's just going to, he's not going to get that credit. You know, so that this, as much as he's accomplished, he still has a lot to prove in this fight. Mm. Well, so fascinating. So, young Cass. No, I was just gonna say, like, if he if he loses, you've also got the added element of, uh, you know, if the UFC does dissolve the flyweight division, possibly, you know, in in the next couple of months or the next month, Cejudo sort of has to stay a bantamweight, where he becomes, mm. you know, just another contender. Whereas now he's kind of riding this massive momentum train, you know, and he's a mm-hmm. champion. How how much of this fight do you think sort of affects? Uh, the, the future of the flyweight division because we haven't had a clear answer yet from the UFC, but all things point to that division being dissolved. You know, maybe in the next month. Yeah, they sure do. I mean, they those signs have been there for a while. And to me, if if Henry Cejudo beats Marlon Moraes, the flyweight division is done. I, I, I just I, at that point he's a champion. He's got some leverage to probably ask for some things. I don't know exactly what those things are, but you can bet that that if 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 he comes off of, of the two wins that he's just had and then he, he wins a second belt, Henry Cejudo is going to want to redo his contract. He's going to want to be the Bantamweight champion. And I think he's, he, he's going to be fine with dropping 125 if that's what the UFC wants him to do. If the UFC says, hey, you know, we'll, we'll give you what you want. We'll, we'll, we'll reopen your deal. You know, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll negotiate. We'll talk about those things. But you're not a two-way champion anymore because there is no flyweight division. I think Henry Cejudo is going to be like, okay, if you give me all of the, all of the stuff that I want, then I then, I'm okay with with 125 dropping because it's really not Henry Cejudo's responsibility to keep that division alive. I know that he played that up when he fought TJ Dillashaw, but at the end of the day, I mean, these fighters fight for themselves. It's not his responsibility to keep 125 open if the the promotion is looking to close it. So I think the flyweight division is on the line on Saturday. If Cejudo were to lose, well, then we got to go back into the negotiating room and find out because because Cejudo is not just going to be like yeah okay dissolve my division and now I'm just on a <laughs> non champion contract yeah. you know there will have to be conversations to take place so it's a very important fight for the 125 division mm. I think you're if you're a flyweight fighter in the UFC you're going for Marais in this fight everybody's there with pom poms just yelling for Marais to win just quickly Brett before we wrap up I got to get your thoughts on Tai Tuivasa taking Blagoy taking on Blagoy in Chicago he's back in Chicago again he's had some success there before. He was one of the, you know, hottest and still is one of the hottest prospects in the heavyweight division. Even even though he lost to JDS, he put on a great performance and sort of just made a mistake in that fight. Who are you leaning towards this one in this fight? Because Blagoy is very, very tough. And sort of based on what you saw in the JDS fight, how far do you think Ty could potentially go in the division? I think Ty's still got a lot of room to grow. He's still got a high ceiling. I mean, to your point, he was doing well in that fight against Junior Dos Santos before, I think, you know, I don't want to call them rookie mistakes, but um, experience played a factor in what happened in that fight. You know, and I even think about, you know, if I'm not mistaken, that was the night in which basically all the Australian fighters were losing. Right. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, and I, I'm not sure if that's something that could mess with with Ty's mindset. But, you know, you, you can certainly picture a situation in which it could be right. I mean, you're in the mm. locker room. 
and everybody from Australia is losing, you know, and then it's like, all right, now it's all on you. And, and he went out there and he was a little too aggressive. I mean, if there's one thing mistake that he made and you want to boil it down and make it simple, he was too aggressive. He was pressing a little bit. So I, I read that he's watched that fight every day since it happened. I don't know if you guys have spoken to him or if, if, if maybe, Maybe that's something that even came off your podcast. I'm not sure where I saw that, but if that's the case, I mean, that's, that's what he should be doing. You know, he, he's, he's, he's still a very talented prospect with a very high ceiling. He made a mistake. He needs to learn from it. If he's watching that fight every day, I'm sure he is learning from it. And I would favor him completely against Blagoy Avenov, but it's interesting because Blagoy is a guy who is durable and he's also a guy with some experience, you know, and, um, and that, that, that wasn't that hurt. Uh, or that proved to be a challenge for Ty in his last fight. So it's it's an intriguing fight. I think it's a I think it's a good matchmaking for Ty's first fight back after that loss. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, I am very excited for this card, guys. Make sure to follow Brett for all your latest MMA news, interviews, event coverage. Who knows? He might even do a shoey if Ty Tuvasa wins this week during fight week. He's shaking his head, which means there's he's saying there's a chance. And make sure to follow him on Twitter. <laughs> It'd be a Komodo ESPN. It become, it's the must-follow account for MMA. All your news, everything that's happening. Make sure to follow Brett. I don't feel like you have enough followers, Brett. You need millions and millions no more. Does. You are the account, the account to follow right now on Twitter. As always, it is a pleasure. And we are finishing up the show as well. A big thank you to Tommy Toehold, Dan Stuff. Enjoy UFC 238. It looks crazy. And for all Aussie fans, let's go New South Wales and the state of origin. We will catch you guys next week.